All right, we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this session on Trustworthy AI for the Future of Publishing, organized by the Committee on Publication Ethics as part of our annual seminar this year under the theme of Together, Shaping the Future of Publication Ethics. My name is Marie Soulière, and I will be hosting this session today. I was elected to the COPE Council in early 2020, and in my day job, I am the head of publishing operations for the Open Access Publisher Frontiers, based in Switzerland. I will begin with a few general notes about uh, Zoom, and then I'll introduce the format of the session so that the structure is clear for everyone. For the session structure, the aim of the session today is really to give you an overview of what artificial intelligence is, how it is used in publishing, um, with some specific examples that we're going to talk you through, and we'll also discuss what are the ethical considerations around that use. I will first introduce uh, the two experts that we have the pleasure of having here today for the presentations. After that, I'll continue with a summary of COPE's recommendations on the use of AI in decision-making and publishing. During this, I will introduce for you the topics of AI itself and what we mean by decision-making. Uh, Nishe Shah will then talk us through how he and his team have been leveraging artificial intelligence to improve the quality of the publication process. And the last presentation will be by Ivo van der Poel, who will address some of the ethical issues we face when using AI for decision support. Without further ado, I have the pleasure of introducing the two invited speakers we have today, Nishe Shah and Ivo van der Poel. I'm really pleased that you've both agreed to join us today for this panel. Thank you. Nishe is the Chief Technology Officer and Head of Cactus Labs at Cactus Communication. It's a technology and customer focused company that provides services and platforms to empower all the users um, in publishing, in knowledge creation and communication in particular. And Nishe is leading the development of all their artificial intelligence products. And we have Ibo, who is the Professor of Ethics and Technology at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. He also heads the Department of Values, Tech and Innovation, and he has authored over 150 articles, books, and book chapters on various themes around ethics and the philosophy of technology. I will reintroduce each of them with a bit more details just before their own presentation. So before you have the chance to hear from these two experts, I will introduce myself, uh, the document, uh, the discussion documents that COPE just published last Friday, and of which I am an author um, on artificial intelligence decision making in publishing. As for other COPE discussion documents, it's meant as an introduction to this broad and complex issue of artificial intelligence. And the aim is really to stimulate discussion about the topic. After we release such documents, we really continue to gather comments um, to add to the ongoing discussion. Also, hence why I'm presenting this today. These, uh, these documents are not and should not be considered formal code policy. We might update them as the, the discussion continues, or they may eventually become formal code policy, at which point they would be republished as official code guidance. So first things first, uh, what is artificial intelligence? As you might know, it's a very broad term that we're gonna use today uh, to encompass all sorts of computer systems, algorithms, and technology that exhibits a behavior or perform tasks that can be considered as smart. Um, tasks that would normally uh, require a human intelligence to be performed. So this would include, for example, making decisions, recognizing or translating speech, or different types of visual perception as well. You probably also have heard about machine learning, which are algorithms that detect patterns and use them for assessment, prediction, decision-making again. It's actually the discovery by the software and the machine of how to perform tasks without being programmed specifically to do so. It's really the machine uh, learning or discovering on its own how to perform tasks from a big pool of data. There's also natural language processing I wanted to mention um, that are systems that focus on extracting, processing, translating, and transforming human language. 
what is important for you to remember for today is that both natural language processing and machine learning are actually subsets of AI. So whenever we're going to talk about these, we actually are referring to AI as a whole. Um, of note also for these discussions about AI and decision making is that it's important to separate what we call robotic process automation. These are the more simple automated uh, processes and tasks that do really uncomplicated and repetitive tasks. The ones that we actually tend to refer to as robotic tasks or monkey work, for example. A typical example of this would be sending template emails to several people with the same text. This is not AI, this is what we would call simple automation. And so what does all of this mean in the world of publishing? Where and why are we actually using AI? From our perspective, there's huge potential to use AI to solve problems that are not easy or sometimes not even possible for humans to solve. The classic example of that is plagiarism. Uh, we now have tools that can cross-check new texts with millions of others and give them a similarity score. These are, there are various ways as well that AI can improve accuracy of some checks that we do. For example, detecting image manipulations um, in some details with copies of pixels that have been moved around or uh, checking potential conflicts of interest from a really long list of affiliations. And you can then use automation in itself um, to speed up a lot of processes, ensuring that everyone receives the right email at the right time about what you need to do. And it becomes even more powerful when you combine two together, when you combine automation with AI. If AI provides a decision and then the automation tool directly sends an email based on that decision. In addition to this, uh, it will be touched on in the next talks as well, but there is a potential for AI tools to minimize personal biases. We all have a certain number of biases ingrained in our decision-making processes, some positive, some negative, some that we're aware of, and some unconscious ones as well. AI could minimize some of these by avoiding this level of personal decision, but there's also the risk of amplifying some uh, biases as well if they are captured in historical data that then the AI is trained on. And so this will be part of the upcoming discussion. Points. To give you some specific examples in the life cycle of a manuscript, um, there are many places where AI can help, in particular, for quality control and quality assurance. I list here various quality checks that happen during manuscript preparation or initial submission checks or during peer review or both. And there are several tools out there using AI that are trying to provide solutions to, these to do these quality che these checks more quickly or more accurately. Niche in his talk will show you some very practical examples of these with PaperPal and PubSure. And I can also share the example of Frontiers where we designed Ira that does a whole series of quality checks from ethical compliance, duplicate submissions, image manipulation to language quality, journal scope, and reviewer recommendations all in one. So there are various tools being developed to address a broad spectrum of issues in publishing and help or make decisions on our own for manuscript quality. When we talk about decision making, we're referring to intelligent decisions being made. So in our case here, there are about the life cycle of the manuscript. And this would include deciding which reviewers to invite for a manuscript, if there is an ethical infringement somewhere, are patients data being used without consent, um, is a paper within scope of a journal, is a paper novel, should a manuscript be rejected because it's poor quality, or even should a published paper be retracted because there's a copyright issue. These are all the kinds of decisions that relate to the life cycle of the manuscript. And when we think about an artificial intelligence making such decisions autonomously without a human overseeing the decision, there are some ethical considerations there. And those are the same um, there would be if a human were making the decision. There is really a need for accountability, responsibility, and transparency. Ibo will address in more details these considerations in his presentation. 
What we wanted to address from our side in this scope document was whether there are indeed processes in publishing where we would deem that AI-based decisions are unethical. From the examples I just gave you, were there any that you thought, mm, I don't think an AI should be making that call? This is basically what we pondered both within COPE um, and then in an open discussion forum. And we also gathered public feedback from comments on our site. And we brought all of this together to provide this document um, with a list of recommendations for publishers and editors and separately for authors in the next slide, I'll show you that. At this stage in the development of AI, we are recommending a cautious approach. As uh, highlighted in the title of the session, trust in AI is really a key point to all these discussions. And it will likely improve over time um, uh, with all these discussions and more transparency uh, but as it is, there was a communality of opinions that editorial decisions that directly affect the outcome of an article, such as acceptance or rejection, these should not be made by an AI tool alone. And neither should the other decisions on the outcome of an article uh, or decisions on misconducts leading to expressions of concerns or retractions. We do recommend that AI systems be used to provide support to make editorial decisions and that publishers provide details on how the AI is computing the recommendations, as well as uh, be transparent about which processes use AI and automation. We also recommend that the publishers keep an eye out for um, any potential biases. Uh, so if the AI tools they are using are propagating bias against various groups, and if so, they should share this feedback with the developers to try to work on minimizing these biases in the AI. Ultimately, from COPE's perspective, the publisher remains accountable for all editorial decisions that are made, whether they're made by AI or by humans. As for the authors, our recommendations are fairly straightforward. Um, as publishers remain accountable for any automated decisions made by AI, authors then have a right to challenge these decisions using the same process as if they were opposing a decision made by a human editor. And so to do so, they should provide their arguments and details to highlight flaws in the decision. We also believe that authors have the right to be informed about which publishing processes and workflows are automated or use AI decisions. And so as an author, you should not be shy to ask for this information from the publisher. So this is the current state of the discussion on AI um, in decision-making for publishing from the COPE perspective. We expect mentalities to evolve quickly as more trust in AI is built and publishers as well as other companies using AI become more transparent about its use and systems become also more sophisticated. I encourage you to read the document and to share your thoughts and feedback with COPE so that we can continue the discussion and provide updated recommendations as this field continues to evolve. I think uh, one of the best people out there to talk us, to us about just how much and how fast this field is currently evolving is our first speaker, Nishé. I already introduced uh, him as the CTO of Cactus Communications, overseeing technology and innovation across all their brands and products globally. He also set up uh, in the last years Cactus's machine learning and AI vertical that's called Cactus Labs. His teams have worked heavily with NLP and ML, so natural language processing and machine learning to develop products for manuscripts. Nishé will showcase today um, some of the AI tools that he and his teams have been working on to assess language quality and manuscripts readiness for peer review. So I'm handing over the screen to you, Nishé. Okay, uh, thanks again, Marie. That was a, a great introduction. Um, hi, I'm Nishé, and today I will talk about how do we leverage AI uh, for publication readiness. So um, what is manuscript readiness, right? How do you make a manuscript ready for publication? Um, so there are basically three main stages, three high level stages before uh, the manuscript goes ahead into the journal process. First is the research and the writing stage where the author does their research and they write the manuscript. 
Uh, and the next are the compliance stages where uh, a manuscript goes through uh, language and the technical compliance. Um, so what is language compliance? Language compliance is basically the written text of the article of the paper. It has to be grammatically correct. Uh, it has to read well and it has to be concise. Uh, and uh, technical compliance, basically uh, technical checks in, in the paper, like uh, say structural completeness, uh, reference checks, table citation checks, data access statements and more. Um, so uh, up, on, up until a few years ago, everything was uh, done manually. Uh, so why automate it? So the reason to automate it is basically twofold. One is to improve the time to publish. And second is to, to assist uh, the journals, assist the author in reducing the you know, desk, uh, desk cleaning time. Uh, at Cactus, uh, as, as Marie mentioned, uh, we, have an, we have a AI, AI team, uh, we call it Cactus Labs. And uh, Cactus Labs basically has developed these solutions, which are currently being used in various products uh, within Cactus. Let me jump into uh, automated language editing first, uh, which is basically the language compliance. In the research world, it is basically called uh, grammatical error correction. Now what that is, there are, there are two ways to, to do uh, automated language editing or grammatical error correction. One is the traditional rule-based, and the second is leveraging the AI, AI uh, system or the deep learning based solution. Uh, at Cactus, we started with traditional, uh, traditional rule-based uh, handwritten uh, rules, but it did not scale well uh, for obvious reasons. Um, there are already, there are, there are some competitors who are still doing it and they're doing it well, but uh, we, we wanted to move to deep learning. We wanted to move to a more modern, uh, modern uh, way of doing things. Uh, so that's why we moved to neural networks, which is the AI machine learning piece. And uh, with this, what we've seen is we, we today, as of today in production, we have very high accuracy, very high coverage of the edits. Also, uh, we've trained our machines to understand context. So as the machine understands more and more context, it can make more relevant edits. Let me, let me jump away a little bit and talk about the AI lifecycle. Since, since the topic is around AI, I want to talk about how does AI generally work? And this is the model that we follow. Um, but I've spoken to many, many tech heads, many business heads, and largely everyone follows some, uh, a similar model. So it, it, everything starts with a business use case. You, know, you, you start with a business use case. What are you trying to solve? And uh, is, it, is it relevant to the business? Then it goes into data collection, data preparation. Now data is everything in machine learning, especially when it comes to deep learning. Um, larger the size of the data, more accurate the, the results. Um, so we go into collecting the data. Then we go into preparing the data, uh, massaging the data uh, such that machine can machine can consume it, can comprehend it. In our use case, say say the uh, language uh, use case, there are a lot of things that you have to do to the data, you know, before machine can understand it. Things like sentence segmentation, parts of speech recognition, uh, dependency parsing, and and so on and so forth. Then it goes into the the fancy pants stage which is basically the AI model creation, the mathematical model. Uh, this is where a lot of magic happens, a lot of black box uh, development happens. And then next is basically you take the mathematical model, put it on production, put it in front of the users who can, who can access it and use it. And then you get the feedback. Now, the feedback stage is super critical because uh, feedback can go into and can, can come to any of the stages. So you can get feedback which says that, hey, you know, your data collection is wrong. You're not, you know, the, the amount of data or the type of data or the size of data you've collected isn't, isn't accurate. So there'll be feedback there, or it could be that, Hey, the data collection is fine, but the way we massage the data, the way we prepare the data, uh, there must be uh, issues there. There are challenges there. So we got to fix that. Or the next is, Hey, the previous two stages are fine, but maybe newer models, newer modern ways of doing AI needs to happen. And that's where model creation comes into picture. And then, or we can say, Hey, you know, everything's fine, but the way we deployed things, the way we're using things is not right. In rare scenarios, you could also have feedback going back to the business use case saying that looks like the business uh, use case isn't, isn't, uh, right. And maybe we want to go back to the drawing board. It hasn't happened to us so far yet, but it does happen. This is an example of, of, of how the machine learning solution works. So the first column is the original sentence that we got from our authors. Uh, we sent the same sentence to the machine, uh, which is output in the second column. And the same sentence was sent to a human, uh, which is output in third column. I'm not going to go through this. Maybe you can stay on this slide for like 15 seconds and then move on. 
this this way you can see the difference between what machine does what human does how close they are how similar they are okay so next i'll talk about how how does what are the different stages of uh, uh, using ai make, making ai basically from a bird's eye view there are two stages uh, for ai one is a training stage where you are teaching the machine what to do and the second is inferencing stage where you are employing the machine to actually work for you and that's called inference sorry the next couple slides are a little too busy but i'll try and simplify it so this is basically a a workflow uh, on how the first stage works i'll go from step one until nine we take the uh, we take the documents that we have edited our editors have edited we align those edits clean clean a lot of data up and then a lot of features are ex extracted from the from the data the ones that I spoke about, parts of speech and more. Uh, there's a lot of data pre-processing that happens. Then it all of that then gets stored into a central graph storage. It's a multi-terabyte distributed storage where all the edits are being stored, the intelligence is stored. From there, it moves on to basic the algorithm stage where the data is being trained. The machine is trained with the data. After many iterations, uh, the output is basically the, the brain, which is basically the neural machine uh, model. Next, what happens is, so in the previous case, this was trained and ready to be used. Uh, now it comes, with, now it comes, uh, now the stage comes of inference. Um, so that's where your uh, number 10 starts, which is your new document comes in, uh, which is unedited or it requires uh, language polishing. Uh, we push it through something called language detector. So at Cactus so far, we've only done editing, uh, we've only built edits, editing uh, capabilities for English language. Uh, so we cannot do uh, editing on any other uh, language. Uh, so we detect if the incoming sentence or paragraph or a, or a paper is in is in English or another language. If it is English, it goes through future uh, other stages. And next comes something called discipline detector. So this is very very interesting. What after many iterations and many many failures, what we saw is that certain subject areas, certain disciplines have different kinds of edits. So we have to make models uh, specific to, to certain disciplines. Uh, for instance, medicine, it's quite formal. Uh, it has a lot of jargons and uh, long words, uh, the readability is tough. While say humanities, it has lesser jargon, but it has longer sentences. So machine does get confused uh, when you feed them both. So we created machine models dedicated to certain key subject areas. Then it goes through various other stages. And we also have something called post-processing system which is again a collection of 100 different rules and 100, 100 different uh, features, uh, which basically uh, suppress any really insensitive edit that uh, or, or idiotic basically <laughs> edit that the machine may have made or certain errors that we already know the machine does and we suppress them so that the output document is, 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 is better, better quality. This is how it looks uh, all put together. Uh, this is again a very uh, high level view. If I have to drill down to each each of these stages, each of these stages will have anywhere from 10 to 100 different processes all running together. So I, I spoke about these stages, but one thing I didn't speak about is this 14 dash, which is the explainability and the classifier stage. So why everything else is is needed for the edits uh, for the uh, for the language to be corrected. This is something this is something of an add on. So uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to build a education system. Where it's, this is not really an AI class, AI explainability. It's basically a grammar explainability where it, it, uh, where the machine basically not only gives an edit, but also showcases why a certain edit was made uh, or what does, what does an edit mean? So next couple of slides, let me, I'll talk a bit about it. So, uh, when after at, at Cactus, you know, after we built this neural machine model and it worked well. Uh, there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of requests around okay why an editor is made let's uh, can we explain that and uh, that's what we built so if, if you look here i'll give you some examples and i'll stay on the slide uh, for example here uh, it says instead of week long you can just use week because long is like an unidiomatic usage this is it's here, here it says zinc element but uh, there's no need of using the term element just zinc is fine and especially it looks like this is like a material science or uh, a chemistry paper. Uh, so zinc itself is enough. This is conciseness, uh, add to in is incorrect preposition use. So this is the real, uh, this is an output from our live system. This is not a, a manufactured output. Again, some more examples, uh, readability here. 
uh, wordiness uh, instead of unit to units to noun number concentration levels to concentration again redundancy uh, this is also pretty interesting and this is very famous in in, a, in some of the circles which is so this looks like it's a medicine paper so you don't want to call it hard uh, to detect instead of hard you can use difficult which is hard is an informal uh, word usage so it's like the difference between heart attack and a cardiac arrest yeah a few few more examples here Yeah, so um, all these solutions that we've developed, uh, we, we, we have utilized and currently they are in production running on various products that we have. It, it, Editage uh, uses it, uh, PubSure, uh, and also PaperPal uh, use it. We've run a lot of test data on it, so that's why the number is really high. But there is a massive, uh, there are there is a lot of tests and there are a lot of uh, words being edited and we are very sure on the accuracy and the assistive, assistiveness of the, of the tool. Um, yeah, so that was on language. I'll speak a bit about technical checks. I'll not go into detail here because it's, it's like it's, it's been spoken about in the past multiple times. But uh, this is about yeah. So on on the on the technical compliance, we have created a lot of these small features and we have bundled all these small features into one head of technical checks and our uh, products, which is PubSure and PaperPal Preflight. They both use it. So we built authorship checks, uh, checking for email addresses, checking for corresponding correspondence information commercial ethical declarations, if your references are fine, if you're citing a lot, self-citation check, if your tables and figures are in the right order, uh, if all tables have captions or all figures have captions. We also built something called uh, ethical use of images, which basically checks for uh, birthmarks uh, and tattoos and uh, human participants in an image. In addition to this, uh, we also have something called uh, journal recommendations that we built. So we've collected metadata of about 300 million published uh, articles, conference proceedings and whatnot, whatever's available on, uh, out there, titles and abstracts and author information. And using that and using the author information, we also generate rec general recommendations. Yeah, I think the last thing that I wanna speak about is commercializing AI. I've been asked this question a lot. I've been asked to come and speak at various places about this and even, even even a lot of uh, companies have uh, come and asked me to, you know, we want to do AI. How do we do AI? And and one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen is everyone wants to jump to the last stage, which is autonomous AI. AI will come in and they will solve all our problems, uh, which is yes, true. Eventually, <laughs> it doesn't happen from day one. So I think there are three three stages of AI that, according to me, one is assistive stage, uh, which is basically the early days. You know, there is a lot of investment, there's a lot of learning, and there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of lot of failures. We've been through this. And many times you have to just keep on doing doing things over. Uh, you learn new things. You go back, look what you've done. You know, throw it all away. Start again. Then, then you go to an augmented AI stage where you you made some good uh, solutions. Uh, things have worked. We have, they've seen you. You've seen early results, and that's where you scale up. You start integrating into your systems. You know, you have to change a lot of processes to accommodate AI. AI is not a drop-in solution. Uh, there will be new learnings, new processes, people who've been uh, doing manual things, they have to start learning uh, how to use the assistive, assistive tool well. And again, you iterate very fast because there'll be a lot of feedback coming in from, from real users. So a lot of iterations will happen. And uh, yeah, and the next is the autonomous AI stage, which is basically hyper automation where AI has really proven, proven itself on, on certain use cases, not everything. And you, you are able to significantly displace, uh, displace uh, the manual, uh, manual effort. And from a business perspective, in this stage, you basically have uh, seen that the model works, the AI system works, your team works, you have the right people in place, you have the right, the whole model in place, and you can successfully attempt to replicate it into uh, other business uh, functions or other, other, other business challenges, use cases. So yeah, I think uh, that is it. Uh, this is my link to the LinkedIn profile. Please uh, add me or, or send me a message and I can definitely uh, get back to you. Thank you, Nishe, for this very informative presentation with all the detailed examples um, of how your team has been leveraging AI to produce these really helpful products and resources for researchers. I think I'm going to take the time for a couple of questions right now to you, if that's okay, as we anticipated at the beginning. 
Sure. So I see one question that was upvoted a lot that I'm going to ask for your opinion on. It's about more the transparency and potential biases when you train when you train the AI with historical data sets. So the question is about whether we think publishers, or in this case, maybe Cactus, you want to answer, if there's a responsibility for Cactus, to, if you declare that you're using um, AI, should you also declare or make details on how the AI was trained public? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So um, we, we, we work with quite a bit of publishers and this question is very common. It's probably the number one question. So it doesn't surprise me that it's voted, voted up high. Uh, but yes, it, there, are, there are details being asked and it does make sense. So I, I can give an example on the, on the bias here. So um, we've been in business for 19 years now. And uh, when we started training our model, when we, when we trained with data from 10 years ago, language has evolved. You know, uh, one may say that you know, language takes a long time to evolve, but we've seen that the language which was there in say 90, 1990s, uh, 1995s, and language which is there today has, has evolved a lot. What, what we've always uh, done and as, a, as, a, as a process, what we always do is we keep on retraining uh, with, with latest data. The other thing that, that we've done, and which you also disclose uh, whenever the questions are asked, is, is about the right, right distribution. The, the good part is that it is essential for us to have the right distribution. It is essential for us to have uniform, uniform distribution across subject disciplines, about, across subject editors, uh, such that uh, our AI can handle, handle a variety. So fortunately, in, in our use cases, uh, biases don't hurt so much. But yes, we do declare all this information, yes. Great. Then I'll ask you a second one that's slightly related, because you mentioned that you're, you focus obviously on English right now, because this is where right. the language of most articles are being published. Yeah. How difficult would it be to then train the AI to do the same for French or Spanish? Is there then an equal amount of work necessary or would it be less from the experience you've gained or some of the technology you've already designed? Right, right. No, so absolutely, there, there will be a lot of help and we will, we will have a lot of, uh, we will have a good starting point uh, because we've, we've been through the whole process and there's, there, are, there are massive learning. Uh, but that being said, as I said earlier, data and size of the data matters a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot matters. And uh, uh, if, if you have to do, say, a French or, or, or Spanish edit, we will need massive amounts of data and, and data from really good experts. So fortunately, the things which have worked, which have worked in our favor is that we don't use Wikipedia data like any, any other language models out there or books data. We use our own IP, which is the edit. You know, uh, we've trained our editors in, for many, many years to make a certain edit. And it, it goes through a lot of stringent quality check process. So we use that edit to train the machine. So that's why the output is really good. So yeah, um, if you have to do French, yes, we will need a lot of data. Or else we'll not be able to do it well. All right, thank you. I'm now reintroducing um, Ibo van der Poel, Professor in Ethics and Technology at TU Delft. His research is focused on um, emerging technologies, AI, and the moral accessible, acceptability sorry, of techn technological risks, as well as the moral responsibility in research networks. He is the recipient of a European Research Council grant to pursue research on the theory of value change in socio-technical systems. Ibo will highlight for us today in his presentation the general ethical issues raised by the use of AI around bias, fairness, accountability, explainability, with a little hint on the implications in editorial decisions and publishing. Thank you, uh, uh, Michel. Okay, so yeah, uh, like me, uh, Marie uh, uh, said, uh, uh, I will be talking about uh, using AI for decision support and, and, and some of the ethical issues that, uh, that, that this might raise. So, so, so uh, my focus is, is on general ethical issues, but where possible and as much as possible, I will focus on the use of AI, of course, in publishing uh, processes. Uh, and it's maybe good to say that, that in most of the cases, uh, I'm assuming the use of AI for editorial decisions. So these are the kind of decisions whether to accept a paper or, 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 or not. So um, my focus will be a little bit less on the use of AI, for example, uh, preparing manuscripts or, or language processing. 
uh, but more on really editorial decision. Although some of the points I will discuss probably also relevant to the other points. Uh, so if we're talking about AI, you're probably aware that there's a lot of debate about, about uh, ethical questions uh, raised by artificial intelligence. Uh, this slide show uh, some of the work that was done by the European uh, high level expert group on artificial intelligence. Uh, and they have uh, formulated and proposed four ethical principles for trustworthy AI. And these principles are uh, respect for human autonomy. Uh, so AI systems should respect the autonomy of people using them. They should be uh, make sure that there is a prevention of harm so that the system do not do harm. There is a requirement of, of fairness, treating people fair or, or, or equally it sometimes might mean. Or, and there is a requirement for explicability or sometimes called explainability. And this European high level group also translated these four general ethical uh, principles in, in, in seven more specific uh, key requirements that you can also see in this slide. Uh, I will briefly mention them. So there is the need for human agency and, and oversight. So humans, basically humans uh, need to be in some way in control of the system, systems. There need to be technical robustness and, and safety. We need to address issues of privacy and data governance. Uh, we need to care about transparency. Uh, there are requirements of diversity, non-discrimination and fairness. Uh, systems have to contribute to social and environmental well-being and to accountability. Now, th this is, these are the kind of uh, ethical principles and, and requirements that we formulated for trustworthy AI in general. Now, some of them are more and some of them are less relevant in, in a publishing uh, context. So what I will do is, is focus on, on, on three main ethical concerns that I think are particularly important in the context of uh, publishing. These are first bias and fairness, uh, second accountability, third uh, explainability. And I will end with discussing a further ethical issue that might come up. And I think that also raises kind of interesting questions. So, so first bias, um, we all mentioned that. Of course, we want editorial decisions, but probably also other parts of, of, of the publishing process to be uh, unbiased. Now, it's interesting if you look at, at, at the literature, people employing somewhat different definitions of, of, of bias. So sometimes bias is, is simply understood uh, as just the overrepresentation or giving higher weight to some elements in the data set. And this definition says, as soon as this is the case, we speak of bias. Uh, and if we take this definition, almost any data set is, is, has bias. And only almost every human has a bias be, because uh, we tend to over uh, emphasize some points more or to pay more attention to some things than to others. Um, uh, this is to be distinguished from, from a more normative de definition of bias in which bias is defined as systematic and unfair discrimination against certain individuals or groups of individuals in favor of others. And that type of bias is certainly the type of bias we uh, want to avoid. As I highlighted, two words are here uh, are relevant. So the fact that these biases might be systematic, so they don't happen just on one occasion, but they in how, for example, uh, the algorithm has learned or in the way people have come to treat other people. Uh, and they unfair. Eh? So not every distinction we make is an unfair distinction and not therefore also not every bias in, in the first very general sense is necessarily an undesirable bias. But if it is unfair and of course that requires a notion of what is fair and what is unfair. So and, and in practice this often means also think we think of, of publishing that we believe that certain variables uh, should not matter for whether. So for example very obviously we think that the gender of, of, of the author should not matter for how a manuscript is being uh, adjudged. That, that is clearly a variable that should not matter. So now if you think about why, why do we have systems with bias or and what are causes of bias, I think there are four main ones. So the first one is, is, is simply design choices. And I hear do not so much mean uh, intentional design cho choices to make the system biased because most people uh, who design these type of systems or machine learning, they don't intend bias. But nevertheless, even if you don't intend 
some of the design choices might lead to, to, to bias. And second, uh, well, one of the main causes, I think, currently of bias is, is the bias in, in the training set. Certainly, if we do some form of uh, supervised learning, any bias in the training set will, will probably end up in, in the algorithm we're using. So, so yeah, a good training set is very important. But bias, and I think this is important to be aware, bias might also be uh, emergent. Uh, and, and with that, I mean that even if we start out with an algorithm that is initially not biased, it might uh, become biased by the way it learns. Uh, and even in cases in which we may be not, may be not AB able to see that a training set or the new data are themselves clearly biased, we might still have a bias ending up in the algorithm. And this is one of uh, the main problems we might have. Typically, such emergent bias also often have to do with if we start to use an application for, for an other use than it was originally intended. And then force, we of course have a bias in the human decision maker. Uh, we, we all to some extent are biased. And, and here, interestingly, AI might also help maybe to solve some biases. So, so I think one of the interesting questions we, we, we need to ask when we talk about this in the context of publishing is to start and, and ask ourselves the question, what are maybe already existing biases in editorial decisions? What unintended biases might we get if we just uh, reproduce the way we do, do it now? So I put in here some possible biases and there might be a bias to, towards uh, native speakers, their English is better, so uh, it might be that they get easily more accepted. It might, there might be a bias towards accepting since things that fit the existing paradigm in, in, in a discipline. And, well, I think it's open for discussion whether that is problematic, but it might be problematic. Uh, there might be bias based on, on country, also in terms of uh, that if people know uh, people come from a certain country, editors might be have a sort of prejudices that that this cannot be as good science as from some other countries, or or, or they might look for editors or for uh, for reviewers from the same country or not. So there might be. So these are just some examples. This is just open for discussion. But I think it is important also to be aware that bias is important because we want to do justice to individual authors. But I think there's also a point about bias is important for the quality of science and for society that in the end often relies on scientific results. So there's also this broader importance of bias. What can we do to avoid bias? I, I, I mentioned uh, already uh, a few things. So, but, but basically you might say the, the, the three main strategies that we might. So uh, one is that we might just make sure that we do not uh, have certain variables, sensitive variables, we might not want to collect the gender of, of the author, for example, or the ethnicity of the author, uh, so that if these variables are not in, in, in the data set, the, the machine learning or, or the algorithm can also not use it uh, to produce bias. That, that might be part of straightforward, but you have the problem of what's called proxy variables. So some things might be writing style, might be in proxy variable uh, for some from other variable that we don't want to distinguish by. The second thing is, is, and I think this is one of the most important things, is, is to have an unbiased training set. But of course, how do we determine whether a training set is unbiased? Uh, and also, like I said, it's very likely if we use historical uh, uh, training sets uh, that these are plagued by, by, by human bias in, 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 in certain ways that at least ideally we would like to uh, avoid. And then a third approach might be uh, using uh, fairness metrics. So there's a lot of work now in, in artificial intelligence, but also particularly also related to machine learning uh, that tries to uh, formulate so-called uh, fairness metrics. Uh, and these metrics, for example, can make sure uh, that uh, the weight of false positives, uh, so uh, making a positive decision where it is not uh, due or, or the opposite, is, is equal between certain groups, for example, between men and women or to, uh, between people from different countries. So, so uh, that in itself raises this is itself all questions because what is the kind of fairness metrics uh, that we found most important that we want to have? 
uh, there are competing finance metrics and it has been shown also mathematically that you cannot design a system that uh, scores well on all possible finance metrics. So you have to make uh, uh, choices. So I think here is also a kind of interesting question uh, whether we want to employ that type of methods. So uh, what does it mean in, in terms of, of questions that I think we need to be asked is that we need to be clear about what biases are clearly unacceptable in, in, the, in the publishing process. Maybe we also want to, uh, apart from that, we might want to distinguish biases that are undesirable, but perhaps not always unacceptable. What are current biases in, 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 the, in the publishing system that we want to avoid? What are new biases that might arise? We, it's, I think we should think of these beforehand. And do we want to employ and which ones are then the most relevant ones? Okay, that, that's, that's for the first point about bias and, and, and fairness. The second point is, 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 is accountability, and we already stressed it a lot. So accountability in general might be defined as the ability and willingness to account for others for one's decisions and actions. Now, obviously, publishing companies, editors have an accountability to authors, but also more both to the scientific community and to the public. Uh, I think, uh, well, there might be some people who debate this, but, but for me, it is quite clear uh, that computers or AI systems themselves cannot be accountable. They, they are not moral agents, uh, so they lack uh, the ability uh, to be uh, uh, accountable. And even if we somehow can ascribe accountability to them, I think we probably should not want to. Uh, but of course, they can be designed to help uh, human autonomy accountability. Now, one obvious way uh, in which to achieve accountability is to put a human in, 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 in the loop. Uh, and in, in, the, in the copy requirements, uh, uh, it was already mentioned by Marie that uh, it is required that editorial decisions are always made by, 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 by a human. Now, that makes a lot of sense, but I think it is good to be aware in general that, uh, and I think this also applies to publishing, that simply putting a human in the loop is not enough to solve accountability issues. So there are two problems potential with putting humans in the loop. So one problem is that, that you might do it too little in the sense that, I mean, you, you can just uh, have the human push the button, but if this human doesn't have the time, the information, the capabilities to make the right decision, doesn't have, does not get uh, the kind of information you see needs to get. Yeah, the human might be formally accountable, but you can ask whether this has a real meaning. Uh, the other thing is that there might also be, in a sense, be too many humans in the loop, in the sense that uh, I think in many processes, and it probably also applies to the publishing process, uh, it might be more important to have a clear owner of accountability than many people who might be accountable, because then you get what's sometimes called many hands problems, that's not clear who to help accountable. Uh, so this means that, that uh, what we need to do to address uh, accountability is a bit more complex than just putting a human uh, in, in, in the loop. So, so one of the notions that have been developed in the ethics of AI is, is the idea of what's called meaningful human control. Uh, and the idea is basically what is simple. Uh, the idea is that some of the core decisions uh, need to be, be made by humans and this need to be done in a meaningful way. Um, so that means enough time and information and so on. And interestingly, people who have argued for meaningful human control have said that, th that this does not for all systems apply necessarily human in the loop. It can also be in what's called a human on the loop at the operator level or a human uh, responsible for the design uh, decisions. And this idea of meaningful human control basically says that if we design systems for accountability, that the two crucial conditions, uh, uh, conditions that need to be met, one is what's called a tracing condition. So any crucial decision being made in the system, like the system to accept or reject a paper, should be, should be traced it should be possible to trace the decision back to at least one human who can be held accountable. And the other thing is that the system should work by what's called a tracking condition. So uh, this whole process should track the right kinds of reasons. 
and the idea here is that uh, what we want to get also if we uh, have some uh, uh, support, AI support for making editorial decisions, it might not be possible now, but might become possible in, in, in the future, is that what we want to get on the table are reasons. Now, I, I think it is conceivable that we can design neural networks that are reason responsive. But the question is whether these neural networks can explicate uh, uh, these reasons. Uh, and this comes to the whole issue of explainability, to which I'm now turning. Uh, yeah, well, let me first mention this question and then go to the issue of explainability. So here are some of the core questions that we need to ask is, well, it's clear that uh, some, uh, some accountability should remain with, with humans, but which humans should have this accountability? And also, how can we create a system that is overall accountable? Eh? Like I said, uh, this requires very clear choices about who is accountable, but also what type of information this person needs, what type of decision processes this person needs in order to be uh, to, to have this accountability. Uh, and I think there's a very interesting question here and how can AI help to improve in accountability rather than erode it. So my view is certainly not that, 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 that AI can only erode accountability, it can, I think. Uh, but if we use it properly, it might also help to improve accountability. Uh, but it requires us to think very carefully uh, upfront about who should be accountable and what is needed to be accountable. What type of information should accountable persons have? Uh, and it becomes even more important in, in, in a system in which we use more AI and more machine learning because it is not unlikely that we expect humans to make uh, a quicker uh, decision in such a system, uh, but they, it means that they have to make quick but high quality uh, decisions uh, and, and need really the right kind of information to make uh, 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 these decisions. So it really requires us rethinking about how we organize these processes, which is a potential to improve the current processes, I think. Okay, let me go to the to the to the third issue, which is about uh, explainability. Uh, so so uh, uh, I think you are aware of this. There is this uh, worry that results of AI might be unexplainable, particularly for machine learning. So, so, so I think there's agreement that, that some explainability is needed in order to know whether we can trust or rely the outcomes. Uh, I think it is also a, a lot of, of confusion often uh, because if also if you look at the literature on explainable AI, uh, people use quite different meanings of, of explainability and what they mean with explainable and explainable to whom. Uh, and again, I think it is very important to think about what type of explainability would we need in, 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 in publishing. So I, I think we can here uh, distinguish between, between uh, three types of groups or stakeholders, you might say. So for those who develop algorithms, uh, some way, some kind of explainability about how AI systems or particular deep learning systems learn is important in order to improve the algorithm and also to avoid uh, biases or spurious correlations. Um, it is important for the editor or the decision maker uh, because this person needs to understand the limitation and potential biases in, in, in the kind of, for example, advice or, or uh, uh, recommendation or considerations the person gets. But this person also needs to understand uh, some of the reasons why if something is rejected. Um, so, or should be able to make up these reasons themselves, but, but, but uh, uh, there's a need. And of course, the author has a right to know the reasons for rejection. And of course, it should be good reasons. So, so there is this problem, like I already mentioned briefly, that machine learning, uh, uh, like reinforcing learning, are prone to opaqueness. Now, there are many methods and techniques being developed uh, for explainable AI. But I think it is good to be aware that at least I'm not convinced that these kind of techniques that are now being developed for explainable AI really would help out in, in the context of editorial decisions, if we focus on specifically on editorial. 
And the reason for that is that most of the existing explainable AI is about causal explanations. So it is about offering, uh, in addition to what the machine learning has found, uh, a kind of causal interpretation or a causal explanation of what is going on. But I think if we talk about editorial decisions, we're not just interested in causal explainability. What we are interested in is in what you might call a justification uh, on why, for example, a paper is accepted or rejected or should be revised. And justification is not based on causes, but justification is based on reasons. Uh, and as far as I know, there is no uh, explainable AI technique being developed that actually can reveal reasons other than causes. So I think that if we want to go here, there is still a lot of work to be done also in AI, actually. So uh, again, uh, a number of questions that we need to ask if we're going to use AI for this. First, what are the exploratory needs of the various user stakeholders? What, what, what do they need to be explained? Uh, what is required to serve these needs? And, and I think the bigger question certainly, and but this is probably for the long term, uh, can we somehow move beyond causal explanations in explainable AI towards justification based on, on, on reasons? And then to, to end a kind of uh, 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 additional ethical issue, which is, I think, nevertheless uh, relevant uh, for, for, for a publishing context uh, and maybe already uh, relevant now. So uh, we're using, uh, and I think some examples we're giving, uh, AI systems might very well be used to, to find plagiarism, or AI systems might be used to filter out some really bad papers or to do a first selection. But the point is, uh, if we understand how uh, uh, AI systems do this filtering, uh, we can game the systems. Or even more, we, we can design an AI system that games the other uh, AI system. Uh, and I think there's an important point here that if we create certain systems, AI systems, uh, for, for example, sorting out or, or, or but also for, for, for uh, improving manuscripts, these things will have, there will be a kind of feedback loop that people will uh, anticipate this and, but also might misuse this. Um, and that creates an interesting and also very hard ethical question uh, because you might argue that in order, if you want to avoid that, and sometimes we might have reason to want to avoid it, we should not completely explain how AI systems work, or we should not have complete accountability about what we're doing, because it makes uh, this kind of systems, for example, that are aimed at detecting fault, uh, less effective. Uh, so there might here be a kind of interesting, but also difficult tension between avoiding gaming the systems and, and ethical principles that often are, are set to apply to AI, like accountability and explainability. And with that, I've come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Ivo, for this very intellectually stimulating talk. You raised a lot of crucial questions for the ethical use of AI, and you certainly have left us with more questions than answers. And I think this is very valuable, but also the perfect way for us to segue into the section of this presentation on all the Q&A. So Niche, Ivo and I are gonna be answering a series of questions. I know you've posted some in the chat. I have a few notes here as well. And um, there are some that uh, Niche has already answered in writing, but some I will still ask for him to get a chance to um, give the answer out loud to everyone as well. I will start with one question that is there to Ibo, which is about, is it uh, worth debating accountability, uh, explainability in the face of fast AI evolution, no matter what, um, as it seems? So won't any and every kind of ML and AI be implemented, whether these questions are debated or not? And how do we implement these better with ethical practices, like the ones that you know the European Union has been <laughs> writing up with the trustworthy AI regulations? Yeah, so I think this is a very uh, good question. So, so 
I, I'm in general not that pessimistic or, or I don't expect that any AI will be applied independent from these ethical concerns. So I think it is interesting. The European Union actually has not just ethical guidelines, but also now uh, regulation of AI, which is actually in some respects quite, quite strict. Uh, and I see you see worries on both sides of the spectrum. So some people are worried that the regulation is so strict uh, that it makes impossible very useful AI applications. And of course, there are people who worry that people will do AI no matter what the ethical concerns. But I think the fact that you see both things are at least to some extent for me a sign that we we finding to some extent here a, a middle way. And it might be different in, for different applications. There might be some things that there is so much power of, of, of big organization behind it that it will be done anyway, even if it is unethical. But I think certainly in this specific context we 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 talking about, I, I, I think I think as far as I can see, all parties are serious about these. And I think they also have to be serious. Uh, about it. I mean, if you're going to use AI for an editorial decision and you cannot explain to your authors why you made the decision, I think you will quickly be out of business as a journal. So, so I, I think in that sense, the ethical decisions also tie into just uh, to any sensible business model as a publisher. <laughs> I will say at least some of the main, maybe not all, but some. So I think the, the explainability Authors will simply not accept if, if you're not able to explain why you reject, reject papers. So, so I'm not that worried that, that these will simply be ignored because certainly in this context, this will simply not, not go, as I think. Yeah, very good point. Um, I'll use that to go into another question that was um, for me about a bit more about frontiers, but also about AI in general. So um, given COPE's recommendations for a cautious approach and Frontiers' promotion of the use of AI, how is that compatible? And can I expand then on how cautious Frontiers has been as a publisher and what are the limits of AI and where will humans always be needed? So it touches on what Ibo was just mentioning. Um, in terms of Frontiers itself, Frontiers has been cautious. We use AI um, everywhere, but we use it to make recommendations for then a human to make a decision. So either internal teams making decisions on themselves, but also based on AI results, or um, editors doing the same. So there hasn't been papers rejected by frontiers without um, a human in the loop. And as Ivo was saying, it's important to also explain um, where the recommendations came from, from the AI. Uh, in terms of the limits of AI, my own personal opinion is uh, similar to what was mentioned as well, is that AI is not a moral agent. So the AI cannot be held accountable for decisions on rejecting papers that could cause harms to humans. Um, I think AI will be allowed to make final decisions when the people who are accountable, the publishers, the journals, have enough trust in it to let it do it. And if that will ever happen or when or on what particular kinds of processes, we will have to see. But I think it will only work when really the, the humans are held accountable and feel that the AI can make a similar decision to what they would make. All right. And then we're going to ask a question both to both me and Nishé. We're going to let Nishé answer first and then I can pitch in as well. Um, Nishe, what is next for AI in publishing, uh, other than text and editorial decision making? How developed are the AI tools now to detect, for example, image manipulation? Right. Um, so what is next? I think there are many things going on. And one of the things that we are working on is on the discovery uh, phase, which is helping authors and uh, discover the new research files, helping them you know, uh, assist writing or doing research from, from day one, or from early in the process. So again, you can go to researcher.life and, you know, uh, we have products that, that, uh, that attempt to attempt to do that. Uh, the second part of the question on the uh, image manipulation, I, I think it's, it's just a lot of people have tried. There have been, there have been uh, many solutions that have been tried on image manipulation. I think uh, there are certain people on Twitter that are really, really good at uh, you know constantly updating everyone around that. 
I personally haven't really seen uh, a solution that can scale well. Uh, there are solutions that do certain parts of image uh, manipulation check well, um, but not all. It is very timely because just a week ago internally we had a chat around it that hey we've done we've 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 done so many things even on image we've done things why can't we go into image manipulation and and uh, we're like okay let's just let's just let's just do some thinking around it. Uh, but yes, that is definitely the the next step. And also, I think someone did mention paper mills uh, in one of the one of the uh, questions. I think detecting generate detecting papers generated from paper mills and and image manipulation was something that that we will definitely look forward to in the next uh, months and years to come. But Marie, maybe you can answer. Uh, you can add more. Yes, I'll answer from the IRA Frontiers uh, tool perspective as well. So it is the image manipulation um, AI check is part of the suite of uh, checks that are done. And um, as Nishche mentioned, there's different aspects to manipulation of images. And so some AI tools can be designed to check some particular parts. So the one we have right now can um, detect if images have been flipped and things like that, or if pixels have been put in different places, or if some parts of the image has been stretched. And so if half the image has small pixels and the other half has big pixels, something like that. So there are tools being developed for that, but as, um, as mentioned, scalability is an issue because it has to compute a whole lot of things. And if you, the big problem in all types of um, image duplication or image manipulation checks as well, being able to compare images to other images, so all the published images in the world, which there is no, no, no database right now for. Um, so that is also one of the big limitations for these tools right now. All right, I will go to uh, Michelle, ask you to answer one of the questions you already answered in writing, just because I think the audience would like that. And then I'll go to one more question for Evo. Sure. So it will be the one about the paper mills. I mean, the <laughs> unintended questions about paper mills. So do we have any concerns about papers that have received uh, automated language editing being mistaken for papers that have been artificially generated altogether? Right. So, so far uh, we haven't uh, had any concerns there. Uh, we've not gotten a single case where it has been raised. Uh, and I think that has to do with, with how, how we're utilizing AI. As, as Marie, you mentioned, um, and even Ibo mentioned in his chat that uh, it, it's, about, it's about using AI for assistive, uh, in, in an assistive uh, mode and not so much a final decision maker, right? Um, so here, what, what, what we do is we, we we use our AI to assist the authors, assist the editors to do their job better, to do their job faster, more accurate, uh, which means that there's always human in the loop uh, before, uh, before it can get submitted or before it goes through the next, uh, next stages. Uh, so given that, I, I don't see this to be the, pa the paper mill paper and the edits to, do with any, to have anything to do with each other. So yeah, and also uh, I I personally seen some of the papers that are generated from the mills, and uh, while they look good, definitely uh, on the onset, I think there are some gotchas uh, which which look obvious. Uh, but that being said, you know there is the more language models are are are, are progressing. There's a lot of uh, AI, uh, GPT three, and whatnot. A lot of things are happening in the in the world. So uh, it may get more and more close to human text. So while today it may not be a problem in future, we'll have to figure out how to address that, uh, that issue. Thank you for that. Okay, I will ask one last question for Ivo and then I will let everyone go. Um, Ivo, do you think we're designing AI and with machine learning to be more human-like or more non-interpretive? And by that, it's more you know, as humans, we have a context, we have a personal understanding, and AI would be more hard, cold facts uh, and applying a code. So what are we most doing now, and what do you think is the best? Uh, yeah, that, that's a very, so, so um, yeah, that's a very difficult, so, so I think one of the things that, that machine learning is, and I think you're suggesting that already, particularly machine learning is machine learning is very good at learning from large data sets and, and finding regularities in, in large data sets, even in ways that we beyond what we ever will be able a, as humans. 
but what AI is not good at is is to deal with uh, exceptions or with specific context or 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 so say if you have the statis statistical uh, distribution the long tail so to say yeah? so uh, and we as humans we we have the we have the capacity to deal uh, even in, in in kind of uh, creative ways, but but still applying general principles to things that that are uh, the exceptions or in the long tail, so to say. Uh, and it is very questionable whether machine learning systems will ever be able to deal with with, with that. Uh, and I think there is also a serious issue here. Also, if you're going to use more machine learning, because and and and. It is also a little bit of a worry. I was wondering, also with, even with the language editing, that that we we get more of the average, so to say, and less things that that deviate from the from the average. But still, we want our worthwhile, or maybe our the even maybe in science, and I think maybe there is by the genius sometimes might be <laughs> in the things that deviate. From 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 the efforts. So I think there is a kind of interesting concern there. H how do we keep this openness from the things that that deviate from from the efforts uh, uh, and then still might be very good in our human judgment, but a machine learning might not be able to see, and and it might also take us a long time to detect because the things in the in the long tail they don't happen so often. So we might first of all, in the first instance, also not detect that the machine learning is actually doing something that we don't want it to do. So I, I think there is a type of serious concern where I think we, with a very strong reasons to keep humans <laughs> and to rely on human judgment still, uh, so to say, uh, I would say. Yeah, it's also very important publishing as you know, with, you know, the new fringe science or the, the new interesting yeah. topics that come yeah. that are no. novel yeah yeah no 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 so so so, so i think there there is a potential danger that, that the things that, that 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 deviate but in a sense but i think the things that deviate and we as humans sometimes sometimes they use nonsense and sometimes they're brilliant so to say uh, and i don't think i'm not sure whether the machine learning can make that distinction between what there is nonsense and is perhaps brilliant and and we should foster so to say <laughs> okay thank you very much that was a really good way i think to end this uh, q a session thank you again Nishé and ivo for joining us and for your really amazing presentations and everyone else, I hope you enjoyed the session and that you learned something new, interesting and valuable today. Um, many thanks again for attending and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Marie. Thanks. Well, thanks, Thank everyone. You very much. Thank you for organizing. <laughs>